Good afternoon. I'm Diana Lawson, the Dean of the Seidman College of Business, and I would like to welcome you all to the COVID-19 webinar series for West Michigan businesses. I hope you are all having a great week and a really nice Friday now that the sun is on its way out. Today's topic, I think, probably affects just about every business that is out there in the West Michigan region. And that topic is navigating supply chain disruptions. We have a great group of panelists who have a great deal of experience in this area. So I hope you find this uh, webinar very informative. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Les Brand. He is the CEO of Supply Chain Solutions. He also serves on our board of advisors for our supply chain programs. Les, thank you for participating and I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce the panelists and get started. You're on mute. You hear me? Thank you, Diana. And I want to thank uh, all of our panelists. Uh, Francis. Francis is the Vice President of Global Sourcing over at Hayworth. Tom is Vice President of Logistics for Meyer. And Larry is Director of Global uh, Direct Procurement and P procurement operations and Larry I'm not too used to calling you Aldecor I'm always used to calling you Amway so you can help us with that distinction further down the line so um, really appreciate you guys joining us we're going to have a pretty good discussion today on not only current events in our business and our supply chains but really starting to think about after post-COVID post this virus how we are probably going to have to start to rethink uh, the design of our supply chains and uh, all of you are involved in a global nature so this is very appropriate. I do want to remind our audience that there is a chat feature in Zoom and just kind of roam around your screen but uh, please uh, tell us, write in your questions as we go along. We'll try to see if we can answer them on the fly or uh, leave a little Q&A time at the back end of our, our discussion. So um, I think we can all agree that this virus has turned our world pretty much upside down. And I think we can all acknowledge that there is no returning to what used to be what we thought was our normal. And the world really needs to start thinking about creating our new norm. So, Again, I thought we'd start with, uh, I'm going to start, Francis, I'm going to let you go first, ladies first. And uh, Hayworth has been deemed an essential service provider for a portion of their business, so they've been able to work through some of these shutdowns. So they've had a crew supporting healthcare manufacturing around the world. They're global manufacturers, so they have plants in and around, and they build office furniture and other sundry items uh, for a global marketplace. So Francis and her team have done an amazing job to build several efficient global supply chains. And so I, I thought to start off by saying, has this virus impacted any of those supply chains or have you build them like bulletproof? Francis? Thank you, <coughs> uh, Les. If you find somebody that has built a bulletproof system, please uh, refer them to me. I will <laughs> work with them. Um, I would say that um, you you were right on uh, with regards to the to the the team that we have at Hayworth. Um, you know, we are a global organization, and although at times that becomes a challenge to to collaborate. Um, times where you have challenges such as the COVID in our case is where you you prove that actually the globality of it is uh, really a benefit. It, it can be kind of a little bit of a, a challenge but it is also a benefit. Uh, you know COVID is one example of call it supply, supply chain disruption but you know historically we've had you know commodity volatilities, we've had you know, natural, natural disasters such as, you know, uh, hurricanes, typhoons, you, what have you, right? Most recently, a, a few years ago, tariff changes. So 
Um, fortunately or unfortunately, as an organization, we have been tested and given plenty of opportunities to maybe develop tools, develop processes to face some of these challenges going forward. Having said that, we're not bulletproof. There are always, you know, when you think you have the answer, all of a sudden this is, okay, this is global. So it's not one region, it's not one, one country, it's everybody globally. So um, the, the systems and policies that we have put in pray, place or the processes have been tested to a level that uh, we had never imagined. I had never imagined in my 25 plus years of experience. Uh, but what is pretty impressive, and it's a testament to the to the group that uh, that we have at Hayworth is the ability to flex and to be resilient and collaborate globally. So um, I would say the bulletproof part of your statement is that we have a very resilient group of members across the globe, not only not only in Asia Pacific or not only in Europe or not only in North America, it's worldwide. So did your did your uh, Shanghai plant uh, suffer any shutdown or were they able to work through all of that and same as India or did you have these phase things happen uh, that you'd have to replan for supply or how did, how did, how did you deal with that? So um, if, if we if we remember this this began late January right uh, okay. early February when yeah. the COVID started in China. Uh, we are a global organization, so we have presence in Asia Pacific, in Europe, and uh, our manufacturing factories and our customers are in all those regions. So, uh, so we not only have globalization from a supplier standpoint where we source product globally, but we also have manufacturing production that supports those regions. In late January, when we heard about it, um, I remember being in California and receiving a call from Franco, our CEO, saying, what are you doing about COVID in China? And I'm like, what the heck? What do I do? So, um, so back then we started to understand what this meant from a supply chain supporting the Asia Pacific customer base and the factories that are in Asia Pacific, primarily China, but also how those suppliers that we source from are impacting the other regions. So it was it was the the, the first. Uh, getting your feet wet into what COVID meant. Um, and uh, luckily, like I said earlier, we have we have established a global organization that collaborates on a regular basis. We have a governance around sourcing decisions in key commodities. So we already have teams established and um, that facilitated enacting some of the activities. So as soon as we heard about, you know, the, the potential risk, we got our teams together and started all our virtual communications across Europe, across North America, et cetera. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there were some situations in Asia Pacific, in China, where suppliers did shut down. So for a period of time, a few weeks, we had suppliers that were not building any product. Okay. Now, now, what happened? If you recall, it happened late January. And what happens every year around February in China? There's the, the, the Chinese New Year, so call it a blessing in these guys. In preparation for the Chinese New Year, a lot of us are used to building inventories and trying to uh, prepare for potential disruption. So maybe the, the timing of when this happened in China and the fact that it was uh, happening at a, a time where we are used to some of the slowdown in China, allowed us to prevent some of the disruptions that could have been a lot worse otherwise. So indeed, yes, there were factories that were shut down for an extended period of time. Our factory in China was shut down. I would tell you that they were able to recover a lot quicker than what I have seen us recover here in the US. Thank you very much. Well done, well done. Tom, I forgot to ask you, is all of Meyer uh, deemed essential service or just portions of the store? How 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 has that worked? Oh, you're on mute, Tom. It depends on what state you're in, uh, what uh, health commissioner you're following, and what executive order you have to follow. Uh -huh. And I can answer all of the above. And that was probably one of the, the most 
interesting. And that was much more for our retail partners at Meyer who had to follow all of those things. But basically, food, pharmacy, and gas station, the, the core things we do, were all deemed essential. So we had to keep all of them running. Um, what we saw as soon as restaurants closed and bars or in other things, everybody, our volume just went up. And then as everybody you know, knows, the, the rush on the, the toilet paper, the, the Clorox wipes, uh, perishable items, the velocity in which it took off, we had volumes higher than a holiday week before Christmas uh, with no notice. And it just hit you. So fortunately, um, we're pretty flexible. We always try to do um, the best we can. I'll back up a little bit in that I even remember the polar vortex last year, what it did to us in a short period of time. So yeah. we're, we're pretty used to this. We, we do practice this four to five times a year. I think you'll probably get into some of that later. But the other thing we've always learned is that if you care first and foremost about the safety of your team members and the safety of your customers, those two things will guide you into how to react not to do anything, it, it, it stops becoming financial or monetary. Focus on the customers, focus on the team members, their safety, and then enriching the lives and the communities you serve. And apply that because when we're in six states, I'm not kidding, every governor, uh, health, we had all kinds of things. When uh, the Tri-County, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb, and Metro Detroit broke way differently than Kent County did, broke way differently than elsewhere, we had to do we set up a drive through lanes in our parking lot, believe it or not. I don't know if anybody knew that, but we set up lanes where people didn't even come in our store and we had prepackaged things of staples they could purchase and never get out of their car. We, we, again, how do we serve the community? We went through things as fast as possible, put up tents and just had runners. We couldn't even get the technology the first couple of days. We had people running in protective equipment doing the cash payment. But we had, how did we get people their products without getting them out of the car? Wow. So we did all kinds of, and it really, uh, it was unique by area. And then the hot spots, as we all know, they moved. Um, you know, Metro Detroit's doing great now. Um, the other thing is all of our drivers, and they go into our stores, they go into our vendors. How do we protect all of them? We worked on a lot of things um, well in advance, and, and we reacted as very, very quickly. And we do have a playbook. Um, I'll give you another example. My inbound team works in an office. They route stuff internationally and domestically. A year and a half ago, we did a, a scenario where everybody worked from home for two days and we didn't simulate COVID-19, but we said, what if there's a power outage? What if the tornado or a windstorm rips the roof off the building? What will we do? And we simulate those things. So uh, we talk about relentless preparation and continuous improvement. And uh, when you practice it, and then you, you have the, the after, you know, you, the, the recap, the learnings, and then you implement the next time. You do that four or five times a year. You may not have the right scenario. We never predicted COVID-19. I'm not going to go out and say that. But what we did was we had all the chain of commands in place. Everybody's team has a, a lead and an alternate. Everybody, th things rolled out pretty flawlessly. We never thought we'd work this long remotely. And it's worked better than we ever thought it would. So it's Talking about what's going to change, I think the way we ch we work remotely, not retail wise, but remotely, is going to be here to stay. Right, we're finding the same thing out town. We're we're more productive. Yes, <laughs> in a lot of areas. How about your online business? Did that? How did you support the online piece? Surged like crazy. We're still catching up. We had to actually throttle back certain hours of the online business because we couldn't keep up the demand. But here, there's another one when, when you know, what's going to stay, that's going to definitely stay because people want more of that. And we're working right now with micro fulfillment centers inside of stores, testing those along with new software to more efficiently pick orders within a store, because we see that as one component that people want going forward that they may have thought of, well, maybe I don't want to pay the difference or that. And um, the ship shoppers got overwhelmed. We know that is a channel now that got accelerated, um, especially with, it used to be people who were more time starved or things like that. Now people who have a pre-existing health condition, they are now much more interested in something with contactless payment, not entering a store. But you face it, everybody still has to eat, still have to get the prescriptions. There's another thing, we flipped our prescriptions uh, to a home delivery on a lot of those items with a third party provider. 
things like that is what we did quickly. Wow. That's, that's fabulous. And what I'm sure you watch your competition very carefully. I just saw that Walmart that bought Jet for billions of dollars are now going to sunset it because they're finding out they've learned how to do it and they're servicing a lot of them directly out of their DCs and stores. Is that part of your thinking too? Yeah, I won't disclose too much, but absolutely. And much more out of our stores directly. And how do we do it then with a spoken hub to other regional stores? Instead of making every store have fulfillment, get the key stores that can support it and then deliver it to the regional stores in a geographic area. That is, we're rapidly looking at that. Yeah. On a side note, Target is taking a look at not getting rid of some of their DCs and doing everything out of the stores on their fulfillment. Uh, so. Yeah. Different, uh, different things happening out there right now as people try to get in front of all of this. Yeah. Larry, can I turn to you for a little bit? Multinational organization servicing hundreds of countries and servicing your independent business owner network. How in the heck do you pull that off in, when the world just got hot in, in like three weeks? Yeah. Hey, Les. Um, thanks for having me today. And, and great question. Um, yeah, it was an interesting one and it has been, continues to be an interesting one. Um, I would say it's, it's pieces and parts actually of what Francis and Tom have already spoken about. First and foremost was, was really focusing in on ensuring that our team members' safety, health, and well-being was at the front of all decisions that we were making. Um, you know, from a business perspective, it, it, it was, all about transitioning to safety protocols for essential workers um, that were continuing to come on campus, uh, both here in the U.S. as well as all of our international manufacturing sites. Um, it was seeing significant, significant increases in nutrition, uh, wellness, and all of our cleaning products, um, not just in one country, not in 10 countries, but in greater than 50 plus, you know, 50 countries uh, around the globe. From a supply chain perspective, uh, you know, we implemented plans uh, that we had in place uh, to be able to work very, very closely uh, with our global supply chain um, from an exterior uh, supplier perspective as well as from an internal uh, make perspective. You know, as Francis spoke uh, earlier, we were able to see in early January from our uh, manufacturing and distribution teams in China what was coming our way. Over the last five years, we have focused uh, relentlessly on uh, source lead time, um, really, really putting into place uh, a, you know, a big goal of 10 days or less on all key raw materials and packaging components for all A products. Uh, while we haven't been able to achieve a, a global 10-day lead time, uh, we've gotten pretty darn close. Uh, through different type of inventory stocking programs, forward distribution center plans that we have in place. And as a result of seeing what was happening around the globe, we were able to uh, break our, our standard protocol and implement our, our contingency plans, uh, which essentially allows us uh, or my team to go along on key raw materials and components. Uh, then implementing plans within our distribution centers and our manufacturing sites uh, to make sure that we have space uh, to take possession, immediate possession of those raw and packed components so that they're not sitting at, at a forward distribution somewhere else where uh, somebody else might, might want to be trying to gain access to them. Um, it, it's, it's been quite interesting. Um, you know, as, as my team around the, the globe and, and many others have transitioned to uh, remote work or work from home, uh, hours have changed. And we've been very, very diligent about making sure that, that we explain to our team members that uh, family is first, right? You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of, of your dependents and your family members um, so that you're in a good position and a good state of mind to be able to get your work done when you have time to be able to get it done. One interesting part about being such a, a broad global organization is the work never stops, right? As, as I go to sleep, uh, my, my, my team in Singapore or, or Korea or Hong Kong or Japan or China are, are getting up and they're getting started. Um, so, you know, utilizing that time zone difference and, and uh, strong teams around the globe uh, has advantages, right? Sometimes we can say, gosh, those 11 p.m. conference calls are really rough, but knowing that you've got a team that's working on something 24 hours a day, 
essentially seven days a week, it, it provides uh, a significant amount of coverage to be able to get quite a few things accomplished. Kudos, Larry, for you jumped in on sanit hand sanitizers like Toronto. Is that now part of the product portfolio or are you just doing this to be nice? Um, it's, we've had a lot of discussions. Um, so yeah, that was, that was one thing that I didn't even touch on. Um, my first, uh, I, I think my first three days that I was working from home, uh, I actually didn't spend a single time, uh, a single moment of that time working on any of our own products uh, or any of our own needs. Um, and we had a, a significant portion of my team here in the US allocated towards uh, working directly with Michigan hospitals uh, throughout the state uh, for uh, personal protective equipment, as well as understanding what their needs are for ventilators as, and, and uh, hand sanitizer and, and uh, various sanitation products. At one point in time, we had to have a call to say, is this sustainable? Can we, can, you know, what, what's going to give, you know, how much more, um, uh, you know, what, what are we going to put off from our own manufacturing uh, so that we can continue to support the, the needs of the local hospitals? Um, so yes, right now it's a it's an inline product. Uh, the hand sanitizer is something that uh, we're running full force. Um, initially, it was it was just for uh, donations for for local hospitals, uh, local nursing homes, uh, as well as for all of our essential employees, um, uh, their families, and then all of our our uh, independent business owners as well. But it will likely be uh, due to you know significant demand. It will likely be something that will will probably continue on. That's terrific. That's terrific. Now let me let's shift to your supply bases. Any issues with uh, as you any failures, non-performance? What? How did you mitigate some of those? These are this is an open question, so anybody can take a stab at this. But did did any of you see there was uh, areas of the globe that fell down from a supplier standpoint or underperformed? You know, I wouldn't say any of them underperformed, but the, what you expected to what you received changed dramatically. And you took what you could get, you know, in the example of cleaning products or paper products to a Meyer store, um, expect, you know, it used to be debiting if you didn't, you know, uh, on shelf available, all those things, we suspended those. I'll tell you that right now, because we just wanted to work. We were all in this together. So we knew it was a little different. Um, the other part in my world um, that I'll, I'll use an example and, and part of our learnings from practices before of when did we have capacity issues with our own fleet or carriers, how can we quickly um, use someone else? An example of that is Brenner Royal delivers to all of our gas stations. Well, gas usage went down below 50%. Or, you know, they weren't busy, they had idle drivers. We quickly picked up their drivers. I had a 30% increase in volume outbound. I wasn't going to go hire 30% more drivers. So, and, and we've had in place exchange agreements with, it is, we've practiced in the past. How do we react to violent spikes? We had exchange agreements already signed. A, a driver already knows what stores they're going to. Instead of going to the gas station, we just have them come to our DC, pick up a load and take it to the store in the store back dock. We have, I have a bunch of examples of where we got real flexible, real fast on things like that to keep things going because the first two weeks, it was, a, it was without an announcement, it was a 30% increase in volume out the door. And we had it in our warehouse so we could, we could fill it. It wasn't, you know, you had to empty your warehouse first before the supplier became the problem and it just went in different parts of the supply chain. But those are examples of how we just jumped and, and got real flexible and partnered with everybody who, who wanted to partner with us. Francis, any problems on your end? Um. It's, it's, it's interesting, uh, similar to what Tom mentioned and, and Larry mentioned early on, particularly in North America, as we are um, facing the, the, the turmoil of, of uh, dealing with the health crisis and taking care of our members and having done it as a, as a, a donor to our China facilities, for example, uh, we, we call it the face mask uh, game, right? Because they were running out of face masks in January and they're asking us to send them face masks. And we're like, why are you asking? Like, how can you be, you know, we were like thinking that, 
you know, why such a rush? Then, you know, turn around a month, two months later, and we're now trying to figure out how to get face masks and not only that, build face masks. So our, our, our immediate uh, shortages actually came in products that are not products that we build, but rather products to help uh, keep our members safe and healthy. Uh, locally, I would say, you know, similar to what Tom said, I wouldn't say it, it's a lack of performance. It's, it's, it's hiccups and, and disruptions that are, call it mother nature, that we all have to figure out how to work around. Uh, we had partners that helped us get raw materials to build face masks, to build, you know, dividers so that we could help some of our hosp hospitals as well, etc. So what, what was amazing was that we, we all, similar to what Tom stated, we all collaborated to kind of get out of the hole you know, and the, you know, when, when you say about performance, it's like really, it's like how could we all rally and recover is how I say it, rather than did you perform badly or not, is is how quickly do you all rally around a common goal and, and reacted. We did unfortunately have a few instances where the, the length of the situation has impacted financially some of our partners. Yes. And, and we have had to obviously work with them or work with alternative suppliers. Some of them have even said, hey, work with this other one because I can't keep up or I need to shut down because I cannot pay or, or you know, for the, for the future of the business. So we have had a few of those. Luckily, they have not impacted dramatically from a customer standpoint. The one thing that we have been... Uh, doing and not just for COVID, we, we, you know, driving customer satisfaction is our number one goal and priority and communicating with our customers is now part of our DNA. So to the extent that there are potential disruptions, we are being proactive in communicating that and usually our customers understand that everybody's kind of on the same situation and they, and they understand that. So um, we've had a few instances, uh, but not to the level that it has uh, created major, major complications for us. Yeah, your supplier communication is second to none. It's really good. So Larry, any issues on your end on the supply side? <clears throat> yeah, we have, um, gosh, what do we have? I think we have just over or close to 2,000 active suppliers that, that we work across uh, the four different categories that, that our team supports. Uh, so part of our team is a dedicated supplier performance management group, and that, that team uh, was paramount to us being able to maintain uh, daily, uh, at times, uh, multiple times per day, communication with our, our global supply base. Um, we saw multiple uh, facility, uh, feeder facility shutdowns um, across India, APAC, uh, broader China, of course, um, and then here in the United States. The vast majority of those suppliers we were able to work with rapidly to get turned back on again um, through the essential uh, documentation that was necessary. Once we were deemed essential um, and we were able to get uh, nutrition and, and uh, home care and personal care products moving forward, um, again, the, the very short source lead times that we have were helpful. We then were able to work with our legal teams, um, our suppliers, legal groups, and, and uh, in many cases, uh, local governments as well to make sure that we could get um, uh, movement allowed. Uh, that was very successful uh, for, the, um, for the, bro the, the broadest part. Uh, there were a handful of suppliers then that we saw where they needed to uh, redesign their manufacturing process to meet safety protocols. Um, in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, as an example, they needed to be able to maintain a minimum of six to 10 foot distance between operators on a line. Um, and the line was not designed for that. So, you know, within a 14 or 15 day period of time, the line would be designed. Um, and then we would see a 50 to 75% output um, of what we would typically see. Um, so there, there have been a, a handful of, of challenges such as that, just like everybody else has faced. Um, but again, uh, probably more lucky than not, those were on business lines that were seeing decreased demand. Whereas uh, on the business lines that we're seeing, you know, upwards of 160 to 170 percent increases of demand, wow. uh, we were not having uh, significant shortfalls or or any type of, of issues. We have we've spent a significant amount of our time on redundancy and our supplier capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, 
That might not mean uh, two suppliers for the same material. It's generally uh, a global source of supply with multiple production facilities that can turn on for us uh, based upon what we need or how we need it. As you can imagine, for a, a nutrition uh, supplement or a, a nutrition product, the registration timeframes and the regulations around that for, for you know, 70 plus countries around the world are, it's not where we can just change a supplier at the last minute. So redundancy in that supply base is, is key for us. Gotcha. Let me skip over to transportation now. There's, uh, there's some issues now going on with ocean freight. There's some issues going on with air freight. There's some issues going on with domestic. I heard one, uh, somebody say that if this lasts too much longer, 600 small and medium-sized domestic carriers will be in bankruptcy. How are you thinking about those items of getting either the last mile stuff or just getting product into your systems? What's happening? I, I can I can give you the perspective uh, from from our standpoint at Hayworth. Um, I, we we um, being a global organization and uh, in the most recent years where we have uh, 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 effected some acquisitions or partnerships uh, at times that becomes challenging but again it's like you know there's the blessings in this guy so we have been able to leverage some of those partnerships and relationships that they have had as well as uh, some of our partners, such as uh, uh, SCS, like like yourself, Les, and others, where we, we try to expand the network. Uh, we also, um, you know, Larry was mentioning this earlier, as you try to mitigate risk by either building inventory ahead of time. So now all of a sudden you need warehouse space because you don't have enough places to to store the product or we particularly in our in our business in our industry we had customers that were essential we had orders that we needed to deliver but they were in states that were locked down so they're saying we need the product but i'm not able to receive it so can you hold it so so the the, the distribution and logistics uh, challenges multiply in areas that we don't necessarily have expertise on, um, and I'll be be honest, we're not we're not the expert in the distribution model that perhaps uh, uh, Meyer and Alticor have. So we've had to like reach out and figure out how do we leverage partners and uh, and and understand and learn what we can do. Um, from a from a, a capacity standpoint, carrier standpoint, we started to see that a lot when the China situation happened, and we tried to obviously negotiate and or secure capacity. Uh, I, I, from a, from a capacity standpoint, it has not been as detrimental. It is a challenge, and it needs to be continued continuously monitored. Obviously, we've all been impacted by the charges, right? You know, the premiums and the rates have been. Uh, significantly higher than we had expected, but uh, Tom and Larry alluded to this. There's a point where you have to kind of take the cost out of it because you want to react to to the uh, So it's been, you know, logistics. It has been more than just the carrier and the driver. It has become the whole um, aspect of storing. Uh, a product and delivering the product and uh, the, the norms and practices even to your point of now safely which again Hayworth had not had as much experience of delivering something to a house because we we don't go to the house but nowadays we're having to so uh, stretching those uh, opportunities and reaching out to the brethren around the community has been extremely necessary once again the teams um, have done a fantastic job at, at uh, reaching out to those networks. Excellent. Tom, what are you seeing? Well, our volume is up, so we're actually trying to spread the wealth, um, and we're using excess capacity from carriers we've already partnered with that have lost business in the automotive business or other non-essential things. And like I, I'll use the Brenner example, you know, they deliver to us out of Holland to our, our fuel stations. Um, we reuse, repurpose that. We tried to be strategic with partners we've had a long relationship with in, in balancing the, the increase in volume, as well as offsetting other people who may have, uh, we, we didn't want any of our, our carriers to lose drivers or have to rehire them. 
So we worked on how do we find to shore them up and keep them in business through this. And again, more of a partnership. And we've been pretty successful. Like I said, we, we had the exchange agreements in place. We've done this before. The polar vortex, we did some of it. We have a very large core base, if you will, geographically. And uh, we just, we flex up and down when we need to. And when other things happen, we've done the reverse and helped others out. That's terrific. That's right. Let's change gears a little bit more now. That's currently what's going on in your businesses and in your supply chains. But how are you thinking of the the net, the post-COVID uh, supply chain? What are you learning today that you need to build into the future? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Sure. I'll uh, I'll jump in there. Um, you know, Les, it's a great question and. Um, I, you know, it comes back down to is what are we what are we seeking to solve for as a supply chain, right? For us, it comes down to we want to be able to service our customers in any way, shape, or form uh, that they demand. What through uh, increased home delivery, whether that be through um, you know a, a better digital footprint, um, and and we continue to fall back uh, on where we landed a few years ago, which is when you don't know exactly what your customer is going to be asking for the best way to prepare for that is to be fast. Um, so continuing to focus in on where are we located? Um, where is that in relationship to not only our suppliers, but also our, our R&D centers and partners, uh, as well as our customers? And how do we get even better on what our order to delivery cycle time is? And as I think everybody on this call will know, the vast majority of that falls into that source lead time, generally, right? Um, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, that falls uh, directly into my lap uh, for our, our global team. So we continue to focus in on, on how do we have win-win uh, relationships with our supply base? Uh, how far out in advance can we give them uh, for look forwards and real-time demand? Um, we are continuing to invest in blockchain capabilities as are our suppliers. Uh, we are continuing to invest in um, all natural and traceability of, of all of our products uh, so that our suppliers, as well as our end customers, will know exactly where those materials are coming from, who's touched them, and how long it's taken them from, uh, in many instances, for our product categories, from the time that we plant that seed in our farms until the time that we deliver you a finished good. Wow, that's great. Francis, how, about what, how you're thinking of the future? It's interesting that um, you know you you had uh, have planted a seed on us to consider how technology changes, right? And it could help. Um, and Larry uh, alluded to it in in some of the things that they're they're doing. Supply chain visibility, if it was important before, it it has just kind of said, wake up if you haven't gotten to it yet. Um, you know, the example of face masks. It's, 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 very, it's a very simple example where I'm sure that you all got bombarded by emails from everybody saying that they had face masks available. And then when you call and you say, well, I'll get it from here, I'll get it from here, and then you could not get any feedback on whether they were available and when they were coming, where they were coming from, and whether it was clear through, it was like, oh my goodness. And that was just a quick example of how uh, how important this becomes, particularly to all supply chain professionals, because at the end of the day, we're the ones in the midst of it, and our customer is saying, "When is this getting here? When is this getting here?" So that's one one area that we are uh, accelerating. Luckily, we had already been in investing in some of this technology from a transportation uh, system. It actually, my team says, you know, it had to happen here for us to like really accelerate. And, and they were like, we knew about it all along, right? <laughs> uh, so, so this is one example where, where we have learned that, you know, trust uh, the teams in, in, in what they're doing and uh, accelerate, you know, for the future. Um, I think for, for Hayworth and our industry in particular, there is going to be a huge uh, change in what the product offering will become. Um, you know, we see that the future is going to be heavy in the working from home. It's not just going to be post COVID, it's going to be the, the future. And we have had to rapidly adjust and invest and look at ways to support our customers 
our customers members that are working from home and we're just quickly adapting i i i, I like something laurie said and i think it's probably my 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 takeaway and, and my uh, message to the rest you are never going to know what you're going to find but it's the ability to react quickly is what i think is will be important for us as supply chain professionals to ensure that our organizations can support that yeah your industry is going to have to do some big pivot i would think yes uh, things are changing rapidly there so yeah i think you hit it dead on tom any thoughts there yeah, in retail, um, one thing I think you're going to see for sure is a, a massive skew rationalization. Mm. The, the wide, wide variety of items. And I'll give one example. It was early March. It was the start of just stuff getting wiped out. I won't name the, the specific brand or item, but there was our, our whole pasta aisle was gone. And there was this one shelf facing of this special diet pasta that nobody was touching <laughs> during this mass buying period. And I'm just gonna, I wanna take that to the buyer and say, we, can, we can't sell it now, we're never gonna be able to sell it. But my example of that is, there were certain things that just are staples we've learned through this. Yeah. If it's Campbell's, who, you know, soups, all this mass variety, there were certain items that they, they can't stay in stock in that wide a variety. And then, we, we've been replenishing to try and meet everybody's demands in layers, not in pallets or in cases. Well, when we had to get back in stock, you had to shrink down the SKUs and you had to get back in pallets and the customers were okay with that because everybody needs to eat, cleaning supplies, cereal, paper supplies, all those staples, you're gonna see that, you're not gonna see this wide variety, I don't feel, of everything for everybody because it's just too hard to get back in stock and even if we have an outbreak in the fall and it happens again, you need to roll a toilet paper. It's that simple. And you want it in stock? I'll give you an example. We have our own dairies. Um, when it came hot and heavy, we were just producing. We stopped the half gallon, you know, all the size. It was just pallet quantities of whole and 2% gallons of milk going out in skid quantities. And it was selling off the trailer. So th that's where we saw the big change. And we, we just saw, even the manufacturer said, hey, we're gonna focus on our top five items. We can get you them faster. We can get you them in skid quantity and, and we can't keep making everything. And they were the ones too, it's not just Meyer. They were saying, we don't know if we're gonna go back to making all these brands, all these you know smaller uh, units that don't sell that well. Right. We're seeing a lot of that supplier rationalization. Rationalization. To smaller and whatever. And I don't know if you all saw this, but there was a little joke that went through. It was a kind of a multi, uh, kind of a check the box. Who's leading your digital transformation? Is it your CEO, your CIO, or COVID-19? So yeah. this is speeding everybody along at a lot faster pace. I think, than they were and Larry hit on it too. What it's speeding up to is, is uh, delivery to home. Oh, yeah. Uh, how do people not interact but get what they need? That's accelerated quickly. So we've touched on technology as a potential major driver in this new world. What, what you know, there could be robotics in the warehouse. There could be uh, autonomous vehicles delivering uh, your stuff, Tom. There could be uh, a machine learning for planning and inventory management and transportation and uh, are you formulating some of the like uh, Francis brought out this visibility I need I, I need to know where that stuff is all the time and where it's at and so I can you know be more effective where do you see some of the stuff you're working on now really start to pay dividends and, I will, and mitigate your risk well I'll, I'll go there quickly because we're accelerating it automation within the warehouse. We're not looking into autonomous delivery for home delivery, but how do you have social distancing within a large warehouse? If you ever saw the Amazon 60 minutes and all those things, I'm talking down to break rooms and everything. And, and um, we're still hiring. So it's not like we're trying to eliminate jobs. It's how do we do selection in our warehouse more autonomously, whether it's through a Witchron, whether it's through T-Sort, whether it's through robots, things along those lines, or how do we, in our pharmacy warehouses, how do we at least use automation to have people separated further apart 
and, and, and have the stuff, not have people moving stuff, but having automation moving stuff to workstations. That's where we're already and have them looking quickly. We just can't have people, large numbers coming into break rooms, large numbers working in aisles with hilos and selectors. How do we get autonomous bits and pieces to start social distancing? Same with uh, the gates receiving into our complexes, uh, receiving over the road drivers, as well as outbound deliveries. That's where we're using a lot more technology. Um, we don't have drivers at our stores going to the stores anymore. Everything, when our driver delivers to a Meyer store, they don't leave their cab. It's all through technology now. We implemented that quickly. We were more lucky than good there that we had a platform, but we used to go in and, you know, just more courtesies, everything here with your order. Just, to, just on that alone, we didn't have them go into our stores. We had them stay in their cabs because for our drivers, the safest place was in their cab. We implemented something similar with technology for over the road drivers delivering to our DCs. They stopped entering our buildings. We, we use tablets and pads quickly along those lines for that part. And we're really heavily going into automation um, to keep social distancing in our warehouses. Good plan. Larry, what are you doing? Yeah, very similar to what Tom has talked about, um, both in the distribution centers uh, for our, our yard trucks as well, um, and then through into our manufacturing site. We have uh, been, I'll say, investigating with a handful of intelligent robots in, in different manufacturing sites. Uh, and in the previous years, it's been 100% uh, focused on repetitive uh, um, tasks, right, so that we can have people where they make the most impact um, and have robots where uh, we don't need uh, to run the risk of somebody getting uh, injured from a you know, repetitive work uh, process. Um, if, if I bring you uh, planning and procurement, uh, over the last, I would say 12 months, we've been working through uh, and we'll be continuing to in invest in, in, uh, and accelerate uh, capabilities that will give us enhanced uh, visibility to where our inventory sits um, and eventually uh, you know looking at how will we be able to help our, our distributors and our ABOs understand where their inventory is um, and help them quickly gain access to other inventory that might not even be in our distribution centers or in our replenishment centers um, but potentially looking at in my old distribution world with in, in a previous life, you know, we could do product reallocations from one hub to another hub or another DC to another DC, right? It's, it's more, in my mind, it's more looking at how can we help our, our distributors and business owners know maybe who's somebody in, a, in another local market or across town, what they have that isn't moving quickly and how do we take their slow move, no move and redeploy that to somebody that is, that is moving that group. Got it. Any add-ins, Francis? Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the supply chain visibility, yeah, which uh, has a lot to do with the, the incoming uh, of, of component, but also the visibility to our customers. Um, we are accelerating uh, efforts on the channel uh, options that we have that are not as traditional as the ones that we have had. So there's been a lot more investment on technology on the uh, B2C side which we have been kind of playing with but now are investing a lot heavier but also even the technology linkages between our dealers for example and us um, it used to be a little bit more up to them and we are now being a little bit more uh, definitive and prescriptive on what it is so that we can enable that connectivity from a technology standpoint of what the customer or the dealer is in our, in our receiving side. Um, one thing that is not necessarily technology, but is to call it process, which is um, a realization or an acceleration of our strategy is um, just really call it the value stream of how product flows between factories. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had some inefficiencies in how our product have gone pr from one plant that's a feeder to another one. And now we are being a lot more purposeful and this has been prompted more by the COVID because the more touches there are, the more lead time there is, the more impact for errors there are. So we are similar to what um, Meyer and Altico are doing. Uh, we are re doing relayouts of our factories to ensure the safety of our members. And that has prompted also movement of product from one plant to the other as well. Right, we're seeing a lot more, and just to piggyback on that, in especially your China operations or your India operations or Europe, 
Are you thinking about a plus one strategy on any of those locations? So it's not just, you know, buying from China or, you know, the closest, you know, what, what, what are you thinking there, Francis? I would say that we have been, we have, we have had a China plus one strategy uh, for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think COVID has prompted acceleration in some areas because there are pockets where we are vulnerable. But by and large, the fact that we have presence in all the continents and we have manufacturing in all the continents provides a flexibility that maybe does not exist for other companies that maybe source from globally but build in one place. Mm -hmm. So we have some of that redundancy already. Uh, we have known that China is not necessarily the only game in town and we know that there are emerging markets elsewhere. We have been working on those. I would say that what has been accelerating is not the strategy in itself because we've been working on it, is be more purposeful more from a new product development standpoint that we're not having to recreate yeah. or fix later on. Uh, that is probably an aha moment that became more evident recently. Because one thing that, that we have an opportunity to do is to do a better job designing, you know, at the best level early on so that we don't have to resource or fix later on um, and uh, and I think that there's a lot more connectivity that hey let's make sure that if we have to double invest in dual tooling let's do it from the get-go as opposed to later on and again so that is uh, not that we're there yet by the way but I think it, it is it has become a little bit easier to explain when you're trying to present that opportunity or that challenge to the teams. Sure, sure. Let's flip over uh, over to uh, workforce for a minute. Uh, we're starting to see tendencies of bringing in more skilled folks that can function in different areas instead of kind of, I'm here, this is all I can do, or I'm here. We're, we're seeing a broadening of the skills coming into the workforce, not Right now or not, <laughs> but I think we're going to. I think there'll be some thinking about uh, how we invest in our future labor force. Any ideas there? I think you'll see some what I would call cross pollination, and more so an inbound of uh, taking ideas that work elsewhere and bringing them. The creativity it has to expand faster, and, and looking at absolute new ways of solving things. It just because the way you used to do it just doesn't exist anymore. So I see us, and we're already starting to do it. It's more so an inbound. You know, the DCs are more step, pretty much redundant day after day. It's more in the sourcing and more in the inbound end for Meyer, to where we're looking at people who who are have a different mindset, different skill set, and how they can move information and not product. You know, is there a way? And it's, we've said it enough in the here this hour already about visibility. How can people bring that skill set of looking at something, looking at data, and figuring a better way of moving the data, and then physically moving the product only once, being more efficient that way? That's where we're already heading. We, you Larry, just have to because it, it makes you more flexible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Larry, any thoughts there? Yeah, for us, um, you know, I, I'd echo what Tom said. We, we really are focusing on uh, how uh, – from a talent perspective, it's uh, we want you to be able to think. Um, you don't have to learn. You don't have to know everything coming in, right? Um, we can teach you what, what we need to know, but but we want you to be the person that you are, um, and and make good, solid, and strong, uh, you know, recommendations. Um, we're investing heavily in in individuals that have the ability to work collaboratively across not only our internal business partners but also externally with our suppliers. You know, in years past. It, it's been, uh, I think, uh, an old supply chain process of saying, well, if you can't get me what, what I need, then I'll go find somebody else that can. Our approach really is we want to have uh, better strategic relationships with a handful of partners. Um, and if you can't get it to us, then what do we need to do to help you improve so that you can get it to us? Um, and, and really investing in individuals that have that skill set and that capability. Got it. Yeah. So what would... What would you tell our audience on um, advice that you may say, you know, I just, 
I'm learning this right now, and this is something I think you guys would really find some value in from a from a high level. Is there any kind of uh, word of advice that you can lend our, our our current audience? Yeah, the only thing that I would say um, is there, well, there there's there's no perfect answer. I'm sorry, Francis. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't think there's a there's a per, there's no perfect answer. There's no um, one way to, to do everything or solve every problem. Um, you know, for us, what works for us is is again understanding what our, our customers are looking for, working with them. Um, and when we don't know exactly what it is that, that we think is coming down the pipeline, it's it's really focusing in on on uh, speed and agility. Great, Francis. Absolutely. I was going to steal his, he, he, he said it earlier and I really, really like what he said. It, it's really about, it's really about your ability to react. And those are the skills that are really needed. You know, how do you problem solve? How do you think creatively? It doesn't mean, you know, go rogue or, or go, you know, cowboy, but uh, be able to, to uh, reflect on that. I think the, the, the other thing that I would add is that uh, relying on your on your partners like suppliers as well as your sister plants we are doing a lot more collaboration where we are offshoring uh, even tasks and workload uh, we're sharing them with members in India and China so that not all the work is done centrally in one place because of your point time difference our, our customers are global 24 7 so we want to make sure that we uh, uh, take advantage of that, but also because it, you know, we have learned a lot from from the the diversity of their thought that that makes us even better. So, so these situations where you're shut down, but you still have to operate. So now I have to ask somebody, perhaps in India, to help me, you know, do something because I can't. Has become more uh, more prevalent, more needed, and um, I would just encourage people to just think that, that not just for COVID or not just for risk mitigation, but that should be kind of the way to think, maybe looking forward. Great points. Tom, any parting words? Just real quick, accept the speed of change. If you don't, you know, you think you're surviving, you're fooling yourself, you're either growing or dying. And the speed is faster and you need to be practicing continuous improvement and being incredibly open to new ways of doing things than ever before because it's out of your control. If you think you're gonna control it, you're not. Well said, well said. Now I've got to ask our host, are there any uh, questions that uh, in the last couple minutes that uh, our this fab fabulous panel can help answer? So I think, oh, here we go. Um, there, I think I think our our panelists. I think you really covered all of the major issues that we've heard from businesses in terms of the challenges they're facing with their supply chains, and, and it, it fits very well with everything that we have been reading, as well as hearing from our stakeholders. Um, thank you, Les, so much for moderating, and Larry, Tom, and Francis for giving us some of your time, your expertise, and your insight. What I really, what I've taken away from this, I think Tom said it really succinctly, change. All, the one thing we know for certain is that things are not going to remain the way they are today and they're not going to go back to the way they were yesterday. And so all of you, uh, Larry, Francis, and Tom, you all, uh, you all noted things like agility, the need for problem solving, for creativity, innovation. And it all comes down to what you said early on in, in this webinar that it, we have to have a focus on people and helping them to change the way they think, the way they work together, the way they uh, interact with people, with other organizations. Um, so I, I, this was really exciting to listen to. Uh, I think we all have big jobs on our hands and I appreciate uh, all of your time and the time that you have been given to your companies as well as to others that you've been working with. So for all of our listeners, thank you for uh, tuning in today. Our next webinar is Addressing Employee Challenges, and it is on Friday, 
the 12th of June at the same time, 1 p.m. We also have a second webinar series that is uh, entitled Leadership Conversations on COVID-19 and the Public Trust. And if you go to gvsu.edu slash Stephen, you can find the links to the two webinar series to look, find all of the uh, webinars that remain. To our panelists and Les, thank you again. This has been a great webinar. Thanks to everyone out there. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.